Memphis. We have the Australian High Commissioner, the Honourable Barry O'Farrell AO. His Excellency from Israel, Naur Gillon. And our very own Philippe Chaney, the political commentator we all are used to seeing on TV. So over to you, ma'am. Thanks so much, and, 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 and thank you, as usual, usual to Avinash and the team at uh, Top uh, Journalism for having us on every year. I just, I just want to ask with a, with a show of hands how many of you are actually journalism students. Okay, okay, quite, 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 quite a few of you. And have any of you thought about doing some sort of diplomacy, diplomatic journalism? Just a few. We're going to try certainly in the next hour, hour to show you the other, other side of it, how interesting it, it, actually, it actually can be. Yeah, the kind of uh, uh, challenges we have seen, seen uh, 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 that have made diplomacy change over the last few decades. decades. Um, um, there, are so there are so many trends, trends that we are going to talk about today. To begin with, I do want to introduce Chip Cherian. He's, I think, only really well-known image consultant, someone who has trained dozens and dozens of brands, of people in public life on how to portray themselves, how to best engage, put their best face to the world. We have High Commissioner Barry O'Farrell, who is a politician. politician. Uh, he's, he's, he's not a diplomat, diplomat in the, in the true in the normal sense, sense of the word. Uh, he, uh, he comes from, from the world of politics. He's had to deal with uh, uh, you know, public, public opinion, opinion much more, more than uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, 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 other, diplomats other diplomats do have to. Do. And, then and then we have, have Ambassador Neil Gillon, who deals with uh, the uh, nitty-gritty of diplomacy in a very different way, a career diplomat. Um, um, so, so when you, when you look at the trajectory, the trajectory and, I'm and I'm talking about the last 25 years, because, because that's as much memory as we can deal with. Um, um, the, last the last 25 years has seen a shift. shift. Uh, there, uh, there, was was a, a, there was a there was a brief, brief idea, idea of, I think I think particularly you know, you know after, after the 1990s uh, that, uh, that the world, the world was, going was going to become a softer place. This is this after, is after the, Germ the, Germ uh, the Berlin, Berlin Wall came, came down after, after the, Soviet the Soviet Union broke down. Broke down. Uh, there, was uh, there was a sense, sense we would move towards, towards softer, softer issues. issues. We, would we would start concentrating, concentrating on development as a as a goal for bilateral relations between two countries. And, and walk really, really away from, from what, what was seen as a path of confrontation, confrontation um, and, and you know, you know, look at issues, issues like, like global poverty and inequality. And inequality. Uh, India, India also, also began, began to, to see a very different side, side of it being portrayed as things, things like, like Bollywood and yoga, yoga and Ayurveda were seen as much as, as Indian brands, brands as perhaps what was, was a, you you know, know, a normal diplomatic relationship with a country. However, about 25 years later, as I said, it does, it does look, look as if the world is in a very different place from what had been expected. Uh, uh, there for a number of reasons, reasons and I can list a few, few which, which have to do uh, uh, with the subject we're discussing. The extent, the extent of global, global polarization, polarization, the uh, rise, rise of populist, populist governments, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, a, sense a sense that diplomacy is much more connected with strategic or militarized thinking. Uh, and, and also, also the idea, idea that, that our big, big powers, powers, and you might, you might notice, notice that we're not looking at any, any of uh, uh, the P5 today, today. Our, big our big powers are, are not really, really very good examples for the rest of us. Rest of us. Uh, and, and, and all of these, these have somehow taken away from, from the ideas, ideas that perhaps we had 25 years ago. Um, so, um, so I, I do want to start by just, just going, going around and, and asking all of you, uh, how do you think diplomacy has changed in, say, 25 years? Ambassador, if I could start with you. Works. works, yeah. So, so I think, I think that, that uh, in, the in the past, past you know, the beginning of diplomacy in the world, and speaking 150 50 years, years ago, uh, diplomats, diplomats ambassadors, ambassadors were really the envoy of the government, government to any, anything, anything, so they, they were had, had the right even to declare, to declare war because, because it took so much time until messages, messages could come and go. So, so diplomacy, of course, evolved tremendously over the years. years. And, and uh, to, today, today we live in a world where most foreign, foreign ministers, ministers and prime ministers, ministers they, they have, have a WhatsApp, WhatsApp and mostly also the WhatsApp number of, of, of their, their colleagues. colleagues. So, so the ambassador's, ambassador's role or the 
embassy's role has decreased in this sense in being the only bridge between the countries. Now there are many, many bridges. You have to adapt yourself. Uh, you, what we try to do is stay in the loop. So somehow that this content will be followed up by the diplomats because if they agree on something, someone has to implement it. Usually, that has to be the embassies of both countries and the other. So this has evolved tremendously. Today, I think we do much more uh, public diplomacy because of social media and everything. It's a bigger chunk. We do a lot of economy. So this economy, defense cooperation, all that stuff. So it has evolved in this sense that we are not anymore the sole bridges and we have to refine our destiny and our role. That's, that's, that's very, very interesting. interesting. How about you? I mean, this is an interesting point that the ambassador is no longer the bridge. I mean, in the old days, you would, would have a leader speak to his, his foreign minister, minister, speak down to the ministry. The ministry would convey something to, to an, an ambassador, an embassy. They, they would then convey that back and it would go up the chain. By the time it came back, it might have been a month or so. How does this, this change? Uh, how do you do diplomacy? I think what's right is that. Yeah, yeah, having, having foreign, foreign ministers able, able to WhatsApp each other provides uh, the, the external, external affairs department or the department, department of foreign, foreign affairs, affairs in the case of Australia with, with another tool to try, to try and achieve, achieve an outcome. outcome. So, uh, you know, 25 years ago I was, I was in my second year in politics. politics. Uh, uh, life has changed a lot, but it's principally the tools that are available to us. And of course, uh, I won't say this about diplomats, but political leaders are often behind trends. And, and I think, I think changes, changes in the world, world particularly COVID, COVID have, have reminded, reminded people that, that until I came to India, India a month before COVID, COVID I didn't know what WhatsApp was. was. Uh, I then realised it's how India operates. Uh, and, and during lockdown, lockdown it's the only way we operate. So, so, so I, think I think that connectivity between our diplomatic leaders and our, leaders and our national leaders, leaders has, has improved because of the advances in technology and because crises like COVID, the lack of summits, have meant that they have to use them. So, um, um, Dilip, you've, you've of course trained so many of us journalists also over the years. Uh, the truth is that, in a sense, sense what Hayek uh, says, says about WhatsApp being this great mode of communication also has, has a downside, downside which, which is that, that as journalists, we are, we are now at the receiving end of information, but it's not really uh, uh, necessarily a two-way street. There aren't necessarily questions going back and forth. Uh, when, uh, when you talk, talk about uh, WhatsApp, WhatsApp universities uh, giving out uh, the, uh, the wrong, wrong information, what many, many of us don't realize is that journalists, too, are constantly being bombarded by social media with messages that aren't necessarily true or, uh, you know, having to uh, deal with them in real time. Uh, do you think the way diplomacy has changed is actually not all good? I think it's, um, it's, it's more, more difficult, difficult actually today. Um, and um, the, way the way I see it is that, it's a simple, simple question. How many, many times do you draft, draft your message? message? You know, you know, when, when I, train I train people, I tell, I tell them that, that whatever, whatever message you want to send somebody, somebody if it's official, if it's important, important write it first to your secretary, rewrite, rewrite it, rewrite, rewrite it, rewrite, rewrite it. it. I, I myself, myself having I mean, about 10, 10 years of experience in journalism, 30, 30 years of experience in spin, spin doctrine, <laughs> I, I promise you, if, if it's an important, important message, I, I do, do not send it directly to the person. person. I send, send it to one person to do a spell check. I send, I send it to one person to do a content check. check. And then, and then I rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. rewrite. My, My usual time, time I, know I know that, that it, you may think, think that it's, it, it militates, militates against immediacy. But, but precision, tone and, and content is far, far more important than, than immediacy. And, and by immediacy, I always mean within, within the hour. That's fine. <coughs> there, there is this belief that, that I have to respond, respond within the minute. The minute. Yes. And, and diplomacy, as, as described, described earlier, was, was meant, meant to be a blunt, blunt instrument. instrument. Now, now in the hands of WhatsApp, it's, it's becoming a precision, precision instrument, a scandal, dangerous. dangerous. It, it isn't meant to be. Secondly, I think, I think that, that the practitioners of this are seasoned, trained, trained people of diplomacy. When, when there are politicians involved, involved when it's minister to minister, 
Remember, Remember many, many of them are not trained, trained in, in diplomacy. So, so many, many of the words they use, when, when analyzed, analyzed by, by their departments, departments have, have completely, completely unintended consequences. In fact, when you talk about the unintended consequences, I'll tell you one of the funny stories in the last few years. And first, there was this force of nature who changed everything in a sense, and his name was Donald Trump. Uh, uh, you know, he, he uh, until his Twitter handle, handle was, was, you know, physically taken, taken away from him. From him. Uh, he really he changed how international diplomacy was run. And, and I, I remember, remember one particular uh, day waking up to a tweet, tweet from him about a conversation with Prime Minister Modi, which, which the external, external affairs ministry had never even announced. announced. So, so he'd already, already written about the contents of his conversation. Before, before ministries, ministries on both sides, sides actually, both which and Delhi had not, and not spoken, spoken about it. it. Uh, have, have you had to deal with nightmares like that? Uh, happily, no, and happily. happily the world, the world won't have to again, again because, because as a cabinet, cabinet minister for Trump, Trump you could have, have a decision made by him at five o'clock that, that he would change at 3 a.m. in the morning. And, and no rational, rational government can operate like that. that. But uh, look, look, we've certainly, certainly we have certainly in Australia uh, tried, uh, tried to be as transparent as possible. Uh, we've, we've had an issue with your northern neighbour in recent times, uh, uh, and even through that process, we've tried to say that. As, as a, a long-term long trading partner, partner to many countries, countries uh, we're, we're always happy to sell our goods because we assume the buyers, buyers of those goods want them. So we've, we've been, been able to maintain a civility, uh, but also an openness about the fact that China hadn't met uh, our foreign minister or our prime minister for a number of years uh, and not hide it. You know, the, the world happily um, no longer relies on journalists to uncover what's been happening. Uh, governments have got much better and so have Right to Information Acts. Well, um, since, since you are being political over here, uh, I do want to ask you about the concept because I, I discussed the US phenomenon of Donald Trump. There was the Chinese phenomenon of the wolf warrior diplomacy. Uh, how much do you think that's changed the world? Do you think others have been inspired in a sense by it or just turned off? Well, it's clearly changed the world and Australia is a good example. They effectively engaged in economic coercion or attempted economic coercion with Australia uh, and they were very open about it. They provided us with a list of 12 demands to remedy it, which meant stop freedom of press, change our parliamentary system. It was just ridiculous. Um, but presumably they think somehow or other uh, it's working for them, whether in the region or whatever. So I can't talk to, for them. But remember, I think this panel is happening in a democracy. Uh, Australia is a democracy. I think in, in democratic countries like Israel and others, um, these things are different because governments have to explain themselves to their electors. Uh, governments can't, whilst governments should always lead, they can't afford to be too far ahead of uh, their uh, constituencies because they may lose elections. And you know, the upside, of course, is that in our countries, uh, as we did a month or so ago, we've changed governments. Uh, but there's not that revolutionary change that you get in non-democratic countries. All right. Now, I mean, a lot of you as journalism students would have read the work of someone called Joseph Nye, who wrote about soft power uh, and the idea that essentially seduction is more effective than coercion. Um, he talked about the idea of soft power being the means to success, that uh, instead of sticks, you should use carrots, uh, the power of example, you should talk about your values that go around the world. Now that seems like a very different place from where we are today, where people don't really want to uh, talk about shared values, uh, where we have seen actually in the Russia-Ukraine war, for example, not just a polarization, we've seen things like, um, you know, uh, people saying they don't want to play Tchaikovsky music because it's Russian. Uh, that was the United States on July the 4th. Um, I think there was an Italian university that said we'll no longer study Dostoevsky. Um, there was a, a Philharmonic orchestra, and I'm talking about democracies here, uh, that have made these decisions uh, that said we don't want a certain Philharmonic conductor because he is not willing to criticize what Russia is doing. That's of course on this side, on the Russian side too, and, and in fact in many countries, we see it between India and Pakistan, we're moving away from soft power. Our artists don't crossover and, um, uh, and perform in each other's countries. We don't watch each other's television anymore. Uh, we barely play cricket together, but very little other sport together. Do you think hard power has, in fact, killed this idea of soft power? I think it's much easier to play soft power in calm times. So it's much easier when there is no tension and no threat and no everything, anything. So soft power plays. I think soft power with many, many countries 
still plays shared values. We, as an embassy in a public diplomacy, of course my job is to promote Israel's relations with India. I would do as much as possible to show the similarities between the countries and probably hide the rest, because it's not their interest. At the end of the day, you want to show affiliation. Not that we have that many differences, frankly. But uh, I think, you know, the division between soft power and hard power, at the end of the day, Israel as is a country that is uh, fighting for its availability understands that there are times for soft power and there are times for hard power, and hard power is part of diplomacy, if you want to see it. Because hard power is sometimes a threat, uh, of using hard power will help you go back to diplomacy or give you a better leverage, a chance in reaching peace by, or quiet at least, by a diplomatic channel. So it's a game you have to play with both of them. And again, as I said, in times of calm, I think soft diplomacy is easier. In times where the world is divided and there is military used and power is used, it's much harder to play soft diplomacy. It seems out of context, I think. All right, Philip, would you agree? Because eventually soft power is the stuff of image building. Um, as I said, Bollywood, yoga, Ayurveda means so much more. Um, uh, Israel is known for so many things around the world. But if I was to ask uh, perhaps uh, uh, younger people, they talk about fauda or they talk about uh, you know, water and irrigation. Um, fauda is soft power. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, but, but that makes the image. Does it also make the policies? I think policy is made by um, the nature of the democracy and how that constructs itself around its objectives. So I have this um, anecdote of a friend of mine who was Deputy Secretary of State for Commerce under Obama. So he was sent to China to negotiate um, in a quasi-diplomatic manner the enormous damage that China was uh, doing to the American steel industry. Vast numbers of people were unemployed. Obama was in panic. And there was a... So he said, I, I had to meet this guy who was number four in the hierarchy. And it took four meetings in the palace before I could meet him. Because they were checking out whether my story was consistent and how much they could push. You know, their, their view. He says, when we got to the big man, he listened you know, to my whole presentation, what we were talking about, what our presentation was, what, we, what our proposal was. And he, then he said, as usual with Chinese, this enigmatic line, which was that when the arm has gangrene, it is sometimes necessary to cut it off. Oh, dear. So he went back with this diplomatic message to Obama. And three days later, the Chinese announced that 185,000 steel workers in China were being put on furlough for a year. So he said he had doubled, you know, he had doubled his productivity by closing down the most inefficient plants because their strategy was very clear. He says diplomacy is about talking, but do you have a clear vision of what you want to achieve? And so what the Chinese did was they raised the production from their most efficient plants and put workers from the other plants onto a furlough. And China had a lot of inefficient steel plants. So that's, so I, in some, some sense I feel that we were talking a little bit about business. When your business and strategic intent is very clear, then diplomats <coughs> need to know what is the messaging. And they can deliver it very well, I feel. Uh, in, in a sense, the diplomat as the, as the messenger there. Um, I, I want to ask you specifically, because you've made the transition from politician to diplomat. One of the other trends that we have seen in the last uh, few years is very much about what is called populist foreign policy. Uh, the idea, and you know, populism has been defined really as a kind of anti-elite, anti-pluralistic, um, you, you see very strong, sharp uh, speeches made by leaders. Uh, Often it leads to very strong friendships, but also very strong rivalries, particularly in your neighborhood. Um, we see some of it in India. We've seen some of it in, in, in your countries as well, because it's a, it's a factor of democratic uh, governments around the world today. Um, should international ties, in a sense, depend on domestic policies? 
or um, you know, is is this a is this a way of democratizing foreign policy, or in fact, should foreign policy be something about an international space, about countries dealing with each other rather than their own personal? Um, Issues. So I, I agree with the latter, which is, and, and my trained colleagues in the audience would say that's precisely what we should be doing, which is having a, an ecosystem in which countries can talk to each other, whether about trade, whether about other issues, uh, uh, in a way that uh, is respectful and equally where, uh, even when disputes occur, that there's some formula or rules in order for those disputes to be um, uh, resolved. And of course, what we've seen in our region what we've seen in your country in recent times is some of those old systems fail to deliver resolution. So the first answer to your question is yes, I have a belief that in a democracy, um, obviously there should be a connect between the elected government uh, and its citizens, but I also believe that one of the responsibilities of politicians is to show leadership. Uh, and ra rather than just echo what the community is telling them, show some leadership to move your country or your state in a certain direction. And, and that's, that's always harder. Um, I, I agree with Noor in terms of, it, when times are difficult, COVID, strategic, economic, um, soft diplomacy gets lost a bit, but it's not stopped Australia, it's not stopped India, it's not stopped countries like Israel and others to continue to argue that maybe, yes, uh, our international order requires some reform to update it to today's circumstances, but there's no doubt that we do need, we do need a system in which whatever differences we have, uh, we, can, uh, we can resolve. The other slightly controversial thing I'll say is that you use the word populist, other places use the word nationalist. I don't think there's anything wrong with national leaders uh, being nationalistic because ultimately uh, promoting one's country uh, to have a place in the world, promoting what um, is unique and what brings your country together, I think is important. So that's reflected well in the my department's uh, soft diplomacy program, where we're told to talk about the fact that we are a multicultural, uh, multi-faith, uh, inclusive and open society. And that's what we seek to do uh, everywhere, except of course on the cricket field. If I, if I may, I want to say something. Henry Kissinger, the legendary guy, said about Israel that Israel has no foreign policy, only internal policy. To some extent, it's true about all the countries in the world. All countries, you know, especially today in the modern age and time where every decision that you make is immediately on, on the social media and you have to be accountable for that, you take it into account. So, you know, I agree with you. The hope is that leaders are strong enough to take long-term decisions also when they are a little bit less popular and acceptable. But the reality is that everyone, every politician, democratic politician knows that in two, three, four years maximum, he has to be re-elected. And he takes it, bears it in mind. But it's interesting because Israel is a specific example of this after all the Abraham Accords happened because many countries decided to open ties with Israel, despite the fact that conventional wisdom would have told them it was unpopular amongst their people. Um, where does that balance come then in diplomacy? Again, it's leadership. I think it's uh, what my Australian colleague said. You need leadership if you think that the interest of your country is to take a step. And I think that we are working very hard with the UAE especially, not only also with Morocco and others, to show the people that the decision was right, meaning we are trying to put a lot of content in very short time into our bilateral relations and show the people there are benefits of this decision. So it's uh, leadership. It's really leadership. Dilip, would you agree? Because, I mean, we see in India the, the obvious example of India and Pakistan. No talks now for seven years. Um, a, a situation where we have no trade between us, we have uh, a very little travel between us, uh, no people-to-people -people ties, even though anyone coming from an outside scenario will tell you that there's so much in common between uh, the, the, the two countries. Uh, do you think it is an issue when domestic politics takes over your international leadership, or is it just, as I said, a democratization of your foreign policy? You know, it always takes a leader to make that change. So the Vajpai diplomacy was an example of true leadership. When you have a strong leader like Modi, you should be able to see this change 
if he wishes it. The only problem is the Kissinger doctrine that it is about dom domestic politics. If it is about domestic politics, the leader is playing the same game. The leader knows that it plays with his domestic audience to continue to have a position of, um, what shall I say, of animosity and um, armed aggression, blame game, all of that. Um, the, I think you know more about this, so you should really uh, talk about it, is the relationship between India and Sri Lanka is an example where leadership can work because there are political interests involved and this is a great time for the Modi government to actually step in and do things which are outside the box because the benefits could be huge domestically. No, and it's important because it can work both ways. Uh, sometimes when the domestic, uh, um, for example, in Tamil Nadu, there is a demand for something that's not popular with the international um, uh, policy side or the foreign ministry side uh, as well. One of the other things, uh, High Commissioner, is what I was saying earlier about the idea that the great examples have gone away. You know, uh, when President Biden came back, uh, or the Democrats came back to power in the US, he said we will lead uh, by the example of our power, uh, no, not the example of our power, but the power of our example. But in the years that have followed, we're looking around, you know, there's the Russia-Ukraine situation. Russia certainly has shown uh, it doesn't care about what is the example it is setting uh, with uh, the bombardment of Ukraine. Uh, we have seen the COVID situation where, frankly, most countries just shut their borders and worked on their own uh, populations. Uh, and none of them showed great success. Uh, whether it's China that even, you know, stopped telling people exactly what to expect uh, with the COVID uh, virus, or the U.S. that uh, began to command their resources around the world. Um, we're not seeing great examples out there. As a result, do you think the world, I mean, you know, this is a favorite Indian subject, uh, which is the reform of the United Nations, which, which should have India in it. But do you think really the world needs new, uh, a new global example, for example, or a new global organization? Well, any organization and, and the world for this purpose is, is an organization, does need uh, to continue to reform, to continue to evolve. And uh, I personally am very sympathetic to uh, Prime Minister Modi and others who argue that that great system that was established post-World War II is in need of reform to become uh, more representative of nations that back in 1945 uh, were not what they are today. But importantly, in the case of a World Health Organization, far more responsive. And so I think, I think you know, um, that it's hard to argue against that. Um, what's even harder is to try and get that reform underway and some system in place. But even in the midst of the lockdowns of COVID, and you know, Australia and India probably had some of the, the longest in the world, other than Bhutan, which isn't opening up till next month. Um, but uh, uh, there, there was good signs. So the Australian Foreign Secretary, the Indian Foreign Secretary, and the Foreign Secretaries from Vietnam, Tokyo, South Korea, uh, and New Zealand were talking almost weekly during that period, not necessarily initially about uh, strategic issues which evolved, but about how each of those countries was handling COVID. They were sharing health messages. Uh, the, the Quad, the Quad which up until COVID uh, had had some difficult times, a lack of commitment, suddenly found commitment during COVID and went from being a foreign minister's uh, standalone at the United Nations to within a very short time, a leaders meeting um, and is doing very practical things across our region again not just in the strategic sense, as it's often depicted, but practically with climate change, with COVID, with vaccines and the like. So I, so I think in the midst of what we've been through, if you look hard enough, you will see that um, rather than isolating, countries have come together, and certainly India and Australia's commitment to working with Indo-Pacific countries is an example of that. Uh, but yes, um, America did go through that period, but happily, again, as in this country back in 74, democracy and election has changed the outlook, um, and we're moving on. All right. do, you, do you think, in a sense, the balance of power has to change for uh, you to be able to see uh, a better example coming up? I think that, in general, the problem of the UN or international organizations, it's not necessarily only the representation question. It's also the procedures. You can see that Security Council, in general, 
if there is a topic relevant, emotional for one of the permanent members, it's a dead issue. Security Council has no chance whatsoever to reach a verdict or an agreement on that. And th this is the paralyzed situation where at the end of the day, no one is playing or hardly anyone is playing an altruistic game or trying to make this world a better place. They're trying to play their game, benefit the maximum, and on the way, if they can do something good for the world, it's not against, it's, it's not against the interest. So, you know, once you know, it, it becomes a little bit harder, you see the differences coming out. And this is what is now, for example, Security Council is paralyzed on Ukraine but on many issues. I mean, they cannot agree on anything that is in disarmament, and, and it's infectious. And that's why uh, I believe that there, you spoke of I2U2, which is uh, uh, India, Israel, US, and UAE, as a grouping not defense-oriented, but rather uh, development, uh, making the world a better place, economic uh, uh, orientation. This is, a, in a way, a substitute to take like-minded countries that, can, that have the powers, the interest to work together for the well-being of their own people, to join forces. Each one is bringing his own advantage. And I think these small formulations are in a way a substitute to the feeling that the bigger organizations are paralyzed. And, and this is part of the problem that we have. You know, at the end of the day, the UN is based on a democratic, I'm copying from John Bolton, when he was uh, under secretary, he once told me that, you know, how can you take a majority of non-democratic countries, put them in a democratic institution like the UN and think that it would work for you? So you think there should be UN democratic and UN non-democratic? No, but he, ha he thought so. By the way, he had the idea of making a UN only for uh, democratic countries, or countries who share the values, and then could be like-minded. I don't think that it's realistic to do it in our world, but there is a, there is a problem here that we are playing in, in a democratic system with countries who don't have this value of dem democracy inside them, so they can exploit it. Interesting. You know, one of the things that I've seen change is this desire for the acronym, uh, this desire to have these groupings come together, but most important is how you're going to call them. So I2U2, of course, uh, sounds a little like the Star Wars, you know, R2D2 or um, something else, but they, they tried all kinds of other things, the Middle East Quad, the West Asian Quad, um, and, and, and other ideas. Um, but I do have to ask, so if we're moving into these smaller and smaller groupings, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a factor of our diplomacy today, um, you have the G20, you have BRICS, you have G7, you have G7 plus 5, you have uh, all these various uh, names going around, you have the SCO, you have uh, the smaller and smaller. There was uh, one particular journalist who's, who's seen, uh, you know, has written a lot of books, called Ian Bremer, who said, actually, forget all of this, we're going towards the G0 world which basically means it's each man for himself, and all that diplomacy can achieve is a kind of you know, papering of the cracks or the talk, if you like. Do you agree? No, I think that at the end of the world, countries would want to work together. They will want, no one wants to be alone. It's a global market for especially the smaller countries, because we need the groupings in order to amplify our abilities. European Union, I think it's a wonderful example of that. Europe, after 400 years of killing each other, they're in wars. They decided to go together. It's not that they have, uh, don't have differences. It usually will be the lowest common denominator in such groups. But again, they are amplifying. Their market is stronger. They work together. They can control COVID together. And there is a price, of course, when they try to do COVID together. Each country try to help itself because at the end of the day, uh, the national interest always is stronger than the common interest, but they try to find the balance between the two usually. So I, I don't think, I think smaller and medium-sized countries, they have the interest. The bigger countries, they can get along alone. I mean, they will always have allies because everyone wants to be a friend uh, of the US or here in the region of China to be on the good side of China. You know, it's, it's a game that you have to play as a small country, a little bit nervous about your neighbors, your neighborhood, your markets, your it's all, everything. So I don't think it's a, I think everyone will look for groupings in the world. Okay. One of the questions I want to ask now is about the challenges of what is called a politicized foreign policy. Uh, there's always been a sense, they said it about the United States, for example, that it didn't matter who came to power. Uh, eventually, there would be a consistency in foreign policy. As I said, this phenomenon called Trump turned everything on his head. Uh, he walked out of deals that the U.S. had made. He 
um, entered into new deals, which nobody kept after that. Um, and you know, we are seeing now a kind of difference between one, one party's foreign policy there and another party's foreign policy. We see it in India too. So I'm going to turn the difficult question to you, Dilip. Uh, a recent study that was uh, carried out by a British university talked about what is called the saffronization of Indian foreign policy. By that, they weren't talking about whether the policy itself is one way or another, but also whether our diplomats are beginning to feel the need to take political lines. Do you think in this new world, and it's obviously a factor of the new world because of social media, because everybody is now reading uh, you know, where everyone stands in a sense, um, do you think that what we're seeing is a kind of slow uh, movement where even your diplomats are going to have to take political tolls? The answer is absolutely yes. And the answer is that it will absolutely damage India in the long run. Not even in the long run, in the medium run. Because when you do that kind of saffronization of your diplomatic relationship, it is a winner if it is a people's issue. But if it is a political issue and you are covering it with a sheet of saffron, that is unlikely to be of immense use to any country. Also, it's very difficult to retreat from that. Once you've gone down that road, you know, for example, the kind of um, power that certain leaders who have no elected responsibility have in these countries uh, to influence diplomatic decisions by India from those countries is now growing. You know, so there are individuals in these countries who represent not the government, not the politicians, but a way of thought. A political ideology. And those people are now beginning to have, I would say, their inordinate weight on policy making, and it's two way. So what they do there with the diplomat is one thing, and then the diplomat has to relay that back here, and that is getting back into the system. So it's a, it's a you know, it's a politicization of the office as well, of the ambassadorial office. It is actually, um, if you ask me, it is a bit of um, weakening those offices and the way those offices would see and react for the future. Hi, Commissioner, could I put that question to you? In a sense, are, is politics bleeding into diplomacy a lot more? I mean, you as High Commissioner, how do you see politicians from Australia, for example, coming here and, and perhaps uh, running a partisan line? Well, I'm not going to get into the party political issues in India. That's a, a career-ending uh, position for a uh, politician or even a former politician as, as High Commissioner. But um, I, think it's, I think it's an interesting process. So we achieved an economic uh, treaty with, uh, with India this year, a trade deal. And that trade deal only came about because uh, the Australian government enlisted the political will of the Indian government uh, to deliver it at a time when for both countries the need to uh, trade with uh, reliable, trusted partners uh, had become one of the lessons of, of COVID. So I have no doubt that without COVID that deal would have taken longer to get and it wouldn't have been achieved without the political will on both sides of the Indian Ocean. My, I'm not again criticising except it would be funny if a country's diplomacy, to me, it would be funny to me if a country's diplomacy didn't match uh, its government's ambitions. Because after all, that is the elected government of the country. So for instance, to, give, to have an Australian example, we have had two successive governments uh, that had an offshore detention policy. And so diplomats around the world, particularly in this part of the world, had to explain why Australia was stopping illegal movement into its country by putting people on islands in the Pacific uh, and denying them access to Australia. A difficult task for those diplomats, but, but they had to do it. That's because that was the government of the day's policy. It was, as we discovered after an election, a bipartisan policy. 
it would be odd for, for, for diplomats not to have defended that, that policy and have uh, talked in India against it. Uh, that's not the way democracies operate. So I, I suspect I know where you're getting because I, I'm not naive, I'm a former politician, but, but you, that is the fine line that you're looking at. Of course you want your country uh, and, its, and its people overseas to reflect the government of your country's aspirations, ambitions and stated and elected policies. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want them to be uh, behaving uh, like political operatives that you see in, in political parties. And, and you are walking that fine line because you've seen a shift in government back home. So, so I, I'm not a trained diplomat, I'm a recovering politician and I've been out of it long enough to know that uh, uh, you know, when you're in this role you have to represent the government of the day. I've done that now under two successive governments. Government changed and I'm delighted to say, as my Deputy Prime Minister said when he was here, that there is no lack of enthusiasm for the continuing uh, the continuing relationship with India. And part of that, can I say, to get it in, because I see the time's running out, is because of the growing Indian diaspora in Australia, which ensures that no uh, state premier in Australia or prime minister can never, can ever ignore India again. All right, interesting. And then, of course, the bipartisan relationship with India is important. Ambassador, do you agree? Yeah, I, I mostly agree, oh, oh, totally agree, but I will strengthen it even more. I would say on the extreme, in, India is a very extreme where bureaucracy is, is very strong. I have, in all my countries I've served, I've never seen such a strong bureaucracy. But go to the American example. When a new American uh, president is elected, uh, all ambassadors, both political and professional, they hand out their resignation and in their resignation, and the president decides who stays, who goes. And this is the other extreme. And because I agree with my Australian, Australian colleague, at the end of the day, we bureaucrats, we can do a lot to influence the policy, but once the inf and we do, because we, have, we possess the knowledge, uh, we possess the processes, we, we have a lot in our hand. Once a decision is made, if I am not respecting it, I have to resign. I'm, I'm a, in a way, I'm a hired gun like a lawyer. Now, of course, if the lawyer or the diplomat believe in the policy, it's much easier for them. But if they don't believe and they cannot do that, they should resign. Because at the end of the day, you have an order. I am not a public, I'm not a public elected figure. I'm appointed by my government. And I have to be able to represent the policy. And again, politicians, you know, we are speaking on a very narrow element of the foreign relations. Because foreign relations are so wide, the politicians are so busy, they don't deal with it on a daily basis. It's only usually when it comes to a very pointy, you know, things that they want to do, take it the other direction, it's legitimate. That's why they were elected for. And we cannot stop them. We can try to convince them. We can do all manipulations within the system that are legitimate, you know, with, with information and with the past and with the history and the consequences and make charts and make explanations. But if I cannot swallow the decision of the political level, I have to leave. I'm, I'm not good at, good at my job or it's not a, the right time for me to do my job. This is either. That's certainly an interesting analogy to the lawyers. Uh, and of course, we're seeing the downside of this uh, in the US-India relationship because, of course, the previous government went, the ambassador went with it, and it's taken more than a year and a half. We don't have a, a, a new ambassador because of the political problems uh, in consensus uh, back home. I want to stop over here and ask all of you, how many of you get, I'll give you three choices, how many of you get your uh, understanding of foreign policy, of the government's policy, as well as international relations um, from newspapers, television, and social media? So how many from newspapers? Okay, this is my uh, future problem. <laughs> uh, how many from television? Fewer, interesting. And how many from social media? You see? Uh, I mean, that just basically says it all. So before I come to you, and I do want to take a round of questions if we have the time to do so, um, I want to um, uh, ask all of you if this is the future, if this is going to be the way people will see their government's foreign policy as well as they'll see other countries, uh, international relations with them and all the rest, um, what are, the, uh, what are the, the, you know, what's the good side of that? How should that be harnessed? And what are the real pitfalls of this coming up? The good side is that you can change your mind quite easily. <laughs> Put out a fresh tweet saying, oops, 
and then say what you want to say. That's the good side. I'm, I'm, I'm just being facetious to make the point. But the bad side is that very often strategy of the kind which I explained the Chinese do is never visible. So you may be going on and on in a certain line and to just extend the point that both the ambassadors chose to ignore. When politics gets to extra constitutional players, then it is neither democratic nor the country's will. And when they also begin to play the social game, I'm so glad that most of them don't watch. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Diplomacy has played out on TV. And it's a good thing because, um, you know, for those of you who don't know, Suhashni spent 20 years of her life as a, as a reporter on television before switching to what is arguably the country's most respected newspaper, which has a heavy bias towards diplomatic reporting. So I'm glad you're all reading. And that's really where it's at, where understanding what the issues are. But social media, you really need to know and filter who to follow and when to watch. Because many people's timelines are not things that you go into. You only see what is on your timeline. But unless you go and see the background on why they got to the point where they said something, you very often miss out on, on, on the diplomatic stuff. Interesting. Hi, Commissioner, this is an important point. Does it really make a difference what you do on social media? I remember when your Prime Minister uh, invented what he called the Scomosa, uh, the Scott Morrison Samosa, and uh, debuted it on Twitter uh, as a present for Prime Minister Modi. Does it really make a difference? Well, it's, it's another example of advertising the fact that we want to be friends with India. So I'm in favour of all medium, uh, but my concern is that some of the issues that you deal with on a daily basis are longer than a tweet. And uh, I can see discussion of them in newspapers. If I can find a blog, I can see uh, some discussion. But again, you have to be careful as to whose, whose blog it is. So I think, I think the great news for everyone in this room is that there are far more and far better and more informed defence and foreign affairs writers in your country, across all medium, than in my country. There'd be, there'd be less than a handful in my country. Uh, uh, and there's no d short of diversity of views in those sectors in your country, which is a good, healthy democracy. All right. Uh, Ambassador, what's the good, good part of this kind of an, uh, an audience reaction, and what's the downside? More downside. For me, I'm a heavy user of social media, I must say about myself. But you know, democracy started in Greece as the privileged men in the town square deciding for everyone. Since then, democracy has evolved to a representational, more stable, every four years, everyone votes, uh, all adults, etc., etc. And in a way, the social media is bringing us back to the direct democracy. It's very hard as it is for an ele a political, uh, politician elect who has four years, four years, five years, okay, four, uh, to take a long-term policy, you know, a building a bridge, a highway. This is a 10-year project. He's, he will suffer the Greens who will tell him that this is bad and the neighbors who will complain and you know, all the bad and his successor will be the one to gain. Now, this is on a long-term policy, but here on the social media, the guy is going to get the immediate responses of the Greens and the, and the neighbors and everyone and he's going to suffer a lot. So it makes it much harder. This is one problematic element because we are back to square one, direct democracy, everyone has a voice more or less equal voice on the social media. There are no screeners on the way. And, and this is, I think, a bad element. Another element is that I'll give you, there is a high profile murder case. There is a law professor who says that the guy should have been convicted or shouldn't have been, but it's a very, it's a, like a 20 tweets and speaking of the past and the precedents and the future. Now his driver, the same day, it takes out a tweet, the guy has a face of the murder. He should have been convicted. And you know what? Maybe the second one in our days will be more. So we are very flat in the knowledge. There is lack, a lot of fake news can come in because people can say anything and people buy anything as long as it's, 
it's uh, readable, easy to understand, easy to digest. Ah, okay. If it's written on Twitter, it's probably the truth. So I, I see a lot of downsides. The good side is, of course, it's uh, liberal, it's open, everyone can have a view, but it, it has a lot of danger when it's the, fr the main source of, uh, of uh, knowledge and not deep. People who learn the history really and are, you know, in, it's, it's a different thing and it's a different world. We have to adjust to the reality of this world. Sure. And, uh, yeah, I, I was going to ask if we could take uh, another five minutes for questions because it, it really is true that saying that, you know, uh, the truth has enough time to put its pants on by the time a lie has gone halfway around the world and in today's Twitter age, uh, fully around the world. Uh, I'd like to take a quick round of questions if I may. Do you want to put up your hand if you do have a question? There are two over there and a third lady here, so you can get the mics. And we'll take all the questions and then maybe one round. Um, thank you so much for the session and the panel discussion. Um, I have been a Rotary Peace Fellow and uh, obviously a representation, representative of India and we had a lot of participants also from Israel. And I felt soft power really worked there. But how many, I think India suffers from uh, uh, preparing students, preparing the youth for an understanding of foreign policy, understanding of international relations, and that probably has a lot to do with the focus of our education. Uh, I felt that when I went to visit a different country, when I went to study in a different country, that is what equipped me with the skills that I needed to understand and have a better understanding of international relations. Now we have uh, people on the panel from different parts of the world as well. What can the Indian government do to improve uh, the grasp of foreign policy, international relations amongst the youth sitting in this room, amongst the, the youth watching our media and consuming media? What can be done? Well, Thank can you. Help more events like talk journalism to start with. Uh, there was another question right there. Uh, did somebody put up their hand at the back? Uh, oh, there, yeah. So my question is to both the diplomats, uh, since prosperity is uh, one of the objectives of foreign policy, when it comes to signing MOUs, uh, especially in terms of economy, the actual realization is pretty low uh, as to whatever MOUs are signed and the policies that uh, the programs or the projects that actually come on ground. So in that context, I wanted to know that with best of the people leading such MOUs, why the actual realization is so low? Okay, that's interesting. Um, another question here, right? Um, could we get the mic up front? Sorry, I should ask everyone to introduce themselves first. Yeah. Uh, hi, good morning. I'm Jyotsna. I'm from Christ University, Bangalore. So my question is that right now we see that journalism is getting more global and more local at the same time, right? So my question to the panelists is how does journalism on a whole affect foreign policy and diplomacy amongst the nations? Very interesting. Um, there one more, I think we can take it over here to this side, this side. Namaste, ma'am. Namaste, sir. My name is Narendra Sirswa and I'm from Narendra Sirswa Academy, Jaipur. My question is very simple. How foreign policy and international relation matters for inclusive and progressive development of India? Okay. Thank you. Perfect. So the opposite really of what we've been discussing. I'll have to stop over here, uh, but maybe we can take questions uh, another time and let's just go around. Um, would you like to start, Ambassador? Uh, okay, I wrote the questions down. But I, I will leave the, the journalist question, I think, to you guys. It's more appropriate. And MOUs, it's a nice question, I liked it. Look, we spoke about it before many times. You know, MOUs is a, is a way to get, sometimes it's a way to promote things, sometimes it's a good way to get good publicity for an, an outcome for a visit. So the ones who, which are serious, which are part of an event will be usually implemented. The others might be forgotten uh, in a drawer somewhere. So that's the reality of life. Uh, you know, good, bad reality. 
uh, I think that I would say I would answer one more question, and, and this is what India can do to improve its uh, foreign policy capabilities. I think that uh, you have one of the best and most professional foreign services I know that I've met, really excellent diplomats. Public opinion, you know, we all refer to foreign policy. We give it uh, sometimes a little bit more than it really deserves. You know, Clinton said it's the economy stupid. So in every country it's different, but usually it's internal issues. I know that in India there is a, a nationalistic approach that there is an important, also in Israel, by the way, we do care about what the world says about us. It's not something we ignore and say, oh, we don't care about it. But at the end of the day, foreign policy is important. There are the people who deal with it. It's good that the people, the population knows about it more, reads more, uh, comes to events like that, and whatever they can do to improve the, their knowledge and understanding. But at the end of the day, we have to put it in proportion. Foreign policy is part, but probably not the po most important part of uh, countries. And India, in a way, is a, uh, just I2U2, we said, two very big projects in I2U2, and this is foreign policy. Yeah? Both of them are going to be implemented in India, one of green agriculture, the other one of green technologies, of wind and uh, solar energy. And I think this is the fruits of uh, dipl how you improve through dip diplomacy uh, the situation of your country and your people. Ambassador very diplomatically didn't answer the question, how does journalism change diplomacy? Well, journalism can have a big impact. So in 2008, 2009, uh, an Indian student studying in Australia was attacked. Um, it was, I, that was my first discovery that India had the same sort of tabloid media as Australia does, because for the next eight years, whenever I did a press conference, I would be asked, is it safe for young Indians to go to Australia uh, uh, to study? Well, and the answer, of course, was yes. My point is that um, an isolated incident of uh, violence in any country, in any city of any size, is not uncommon. But suddenly, the reports from, uh, from Australia in the Indian media threatened the relationship. Uh, it was extraordinary. And can I say to our friend down the back about MOUs, uh, um, I found, I found both as a Chief Minister of Australia coming to here, uh, but also as a diplomat, that you need to think about this. An MOU is like a first date. And if you work hard at it, you can have a very strong relationship emerging. Dilip, do you want to answer some of the questions and maybe wrap this up? No, I think I'm, I'm good. They've, they've both answered it very competently. No, so well, I, I have to thank, thank the panel here. It's certainly what someone said to me, diplomacy, like politics, has the same imperative, which is you have to have the patience to be able to plant a seed and know that it may be someone, your grandchild's generation, that will actually uh, be able to cut the fruit and eat it uh, from what you're doing. Uh, but you've been a great audience, so thank you so much, and thank you to all our panelists. Uh, thank you so much, distinguished speakers, for this insightful session. I believe uh, diplomacy is a topic which is discussed uh, very less on such forums. And I believe that there should be more talk journalism to discuss about it. Thank you so much once again for being the part of uh, Talk Journalism, the seventh edition. And uh, I would welcome uh, Mr. Jamil Khan to please come on the stage and uh, honor the speakers with a token of appreciation. Ms. Suhasni Heather, Mr. Dilip Cherian, uh, Sir Barry O'Farrell, and Sir Noor Gillon. Thank you so much once again.